Stone presentation. Um, my name is Hiba Gerard, and my project is on modeling the forest structure and basal area of the Medway Community Forest Co-op through UAB-derived remote sensing imagery. Um, so just to get started with the introduction, so the Medway Community Forest Co-op is a community-based Crown Land licensee located in Annapolis County, Nova Scotia, and established in 2015. Prior to being Crown Land, the MCFC was owned by Bowater Mercy Paper, a private company company that went out of business in 2012. Due to intensive management in the past, 45% of the forest is less than 35 years old. In addition, a biodiversity assessment conducted by a previous MFC student found that the forest was in poor condition due to these past harvests and that there was a need for management through low intensity harvest practices that mimic natural disturbances and complex canopy distributions. Despite the condition of the forest, one of the main tenets of the MCFC is to protect ecological forestry with full transparency and engagement with the community. So another initiative of the forest is the many studies and research that takes place there. So one such um, research was in August 2019. So Oryx Geoscience flew the Wingtra 1 drone over approximately a third of the Medway as a pilot project to expand their geospatial services from mining to forestry. The original purpose of the data was to collect remote sensing imagery to conduct a study to identify and model pests and diseases in trees. Um, and the drone collects imagery in five bands, so red, green, blue, infrared, and red edge. Um, and then with point cloud data, you can actually create a digital surface model and a digital terrain model. So previous studies have actually found that um, a canopy height model derived from these elevation models um, could be used to model stand metrics such as volume density and basal area. Therefore, given the history of the forest, I decided to mo model basal area and forest structure to provide information on which areas need additional management and regeneration efforts, as well as provide a map that could aid in identifying areas that could be potential harvest sites. So, um, just to sum up, my objectives were to derive a canopy height model, derive stand level models for basal area and forest structure using ground data and the derived canopy height model, and lastly, to provide recommendations on forest management and future analysis of remotely sensed imagery of the Medway forest to help remediate the forest from past intensive even age management. So moving on to the methods. Um, so I first started with 123 ground plots spanning three data sets collected between 2019 and 2020. Um, however, given quality and boundary issues within the imaged area, 49 plots were used. Each plot consisted of a prism sweep at a BAF of two and a tally of the species composition by four DBH classes as seen listed in the slide. The data was stratified by species type and stand age, um, which are white pine, red maple, red spruce, and black spruce dominated stands, stand types. Um, and then it was also stratified by age, so young, mature, and old growth. This was done to ensure that there was an equal distribution between stand types. Um, after that, each index measured a different attribute of structural diversity. So structural diversity is calculated using the distribution of basal area between the DBH size intervals listed above. So the Gini coefficient looks at the range and how similar each class size is to each other. The Macintosh even evenness index, similar to the Gini coefficient, but looks at the evenness and how abundant each size class is. Lastly, the Berger Parker index, which I'm going to call the BP index, looks at the dominant size class compared to the total basal area. So moving on to getting data for the model. So to get the canopy height model, I needed to first edit the digital surface model to remove poor quality data. After that, the canopy height model was created by taking the difference between the digital terrain model and the digital surface model. Zonal statistics were then run on the canopy height model based on the area of the ground data plots. The following metrics were then calculated. Maximum height, mean height, median height, range, so the difference between the maximum and minimum height, majority, the most common height within the specified area, and the variety, the number of unique heights within the specified area. Lastly, after getting the stand level metrics from the canopy height model, I use those values to run multiple linear regressions in R for basal area and each structural indices. The best fit models were then used to, map, to make maps in ArcGIS, and an additional unsupervised classification was also run on the canopy height model. With that, the methods are done, and then we're moving on to results. So 
Um, here is the canopy height model. So it shows the heights of the forest. Um, I ran an unsupervised classification just to look at the landscape and look at how um, it's categorized. So what I found was that 25% of the forest is less than one meter in height. 24% is between two to four meters. 15.5% is, uh, is um, five to six meters. 22.5% is seven to 10 meters. And then 13% is between 11 to 30 meters. So over 11 meters. Just another note too, for the rest of the presentation, I will be showing maps of this highlighted portion as it is easier to make up details at a finer scale. And then moving on to the models. Um, so this is the first model, the Gini coefficient model. The R squared of the model was 28% and the predictor valuables were mean and median as seen on the table on the right. Um, however, when looking at the graph on the left, um, which is a comparison of the predicted versus measured um, values, it over predicted areas with low structural diversity, and under predicted areas with high structural diversity. Um, and then moving on to the Macintosh evenness index model, the R squared of this model was 21% and the predictive variables were the same as the Gini coefficient, the mean and median again as seen on the table on the right. Um, similar to the Gini coefficient model, it primarily um, over predicted or not similar, I guess, it primarily over predicted areas with low structural diversity. So you can see that when looking at the bottom left of the graph and how um, the differences between the predicted and measured values are higher um, than the top half. Um, so moving on to the next model, the BP index model. Um, this was the um, this explained 32% of the variation. So that's the R squared value. And the predictor valuables were variety, median, and majority. Um, again, as seen before, it, it under predicted values of low structural diversity. Then moving on to the maps. Um, so here's the map of the BP index. So with pink, so uh, value of one showing higher structural diversity and then a range to zero, um, and then lighter areas showing less structural diversity. So there's a couple points to make um, with this map. So just to start out, I removed areas that were less than one meter in the canopy height model as um, given the over predicting effect. And since those areas are so low in height, so under one meter, um, it didn't really appear to be relevant when measuring structural diversity, um, just in the context of this specific um, map and project. So, um, Another point to make with this map is that there are distinct areas with low structural diversity and high structural diversity. So you can see a lot of contrast in the map. Then moving on to the basal area model. So this was the last model done. Um, explain the most variation with an R squared value of 55% and the predictor variables for median range and interaction variables with maximum median and maximum range. Um, the model did show over predicting areas with low VA and a little bit of under predicting the higher ends. However, an interesting point to make is that um, I'm just going to highlight that point on the left, um, if you can see it, uh, is that that area has a basal area of four, um, but it does have noted white pine blister rust. Therefore, it is possible that the model is actually picking up on standing white pines, so standing dead trees, and assuming a higher basal area. And then moving on to the map. So this is a map of the basal area model with redder areas showing higher values and again lighter areas showing um, lower basal areas. So two interesting points with this map is you can again see the contrast but you can also see how fragmented the landscape is. So the um, there are pronounced areas of low basal area in comparison to high. And then I'm just going to highlight another portion of the map. So you can also see a lot of the pronounced edge effects along water bodies. And this is most likely due to the provincially legislated 20 meter buffer. So you can kind of see rings of red around the water bodies indicating higher basal area. All right, and then on to discussion and recommendations. So just starting out with the models them themselves in regards to forest structural indices, the Gini coefficient and the Macintosh index, evenness index, were the most similar as they had the same predictor variables. However, both showed distinct bias. The BP index showed a less pronounced under predicting over predicting effect, and therefore it may be the most suitable to use when assessing forest structure. However, given the overall low R squared value, more ground plots and research may be needed to more accurately model forest structure. 
Another point is that the median um, metric was, was a common predictor found in all models, and it appeared to have an inverse relationship with metrics that explain variation in the data. So the models may then have worked in two ways. So a general positive relationship between taller heights and more basal area and structural diversity. And then I'm just going to highlight another portion of the photo on the left. Um, so large differences between the median coefficient are an inverse relationship between the median coefficient and remaining coefficients indicating less basal area and structural diversity. So you can see on the photo on the left, a lot of the um, clear cuts or intensive management practices um, left uh, pine trees for pine seed tree harvest. And so they retain about 10 to three between in these clear cut stands. So the high variation may have indicated lower basal area in the model. A minute mark. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and then just these shortcomings of the model. So the models consistently overpredicted in stands with lower basal area and less structural diversity. This may be due to two reasons. Um, so a lack of ground data in clear cut stands and due to that lack of ground data um, in these young stands, the model assuming initial high basal area and structural diversity. However, the basal area model did have a higher R squared value and it may be a good predictor in areas with high height, higher heights. So as seen in the canopy height model. Another point to make on the um, ground data itself is that the data was actually mostly obtained from mature stands and young forested stands. So the, um, I use the uh, forest resource inventory. So the young stands may have appeared young, but may, there may have been some inaccuracies in the ground data. All right, and then moving on to recommendations. So as mentioned before, the landscape is highly fragmented with prominent edge effects surrounding riparian zones. So I recommend uh, the Medway consider increasing their buffers from the set 30 meters that the MCFC uses to a higher buffer range. I also recommend that the MCFC continues low intensity harvesting methods, particularly to promote regeneration and structural diversity in young even age managed stands as found in the models or past young even aged stands. Um, and then lastly, so there are a variety of future studies that can be implemented, especially since recently the Department of Lands and Forestry has released LIDAR data, including the point cloud for the whole of the Medway Forest. So I recommend improving basal area and structural diversity modeling by using LIDAR data and additional ground points in young stands. Um, I also recommend doing habitat suitability modeling, um, which could be explored by conducting a connectivity analysis and through implementing biodiversity plots along water bodies and young stands. Lastly, I recommend that the Medway continue with the original plan for the data and conduct a study on the identification of disease and pest disturbances like the hemlock woolly adelgid that's actually seen on the photo on the right, which is um, increasingly being seen in Nova Scotia and is a very real concern for Nova Scotian forests. So furthermore, um, as seen in the basal area model, standing dead, tree, standing dead trees may be picked up in areas with higher heights and low NDVI, so low vegetation indices, may be a way to pick up on these disturbances. So with that, I'd like to um, thank a couple of people. So I'd like to thank Dr. John Casperson, so my internal supervisor for helping me out with the model and kind of explaining everything when I was <laughs> very confused about it. Um, and then also my external supervisor, uh, Mary Jane Roger, for just being like a really great boss um, and being really supportive. Special thanks to um, Jenica Hunziger, um, which I worked a lot in the summer and then also helped and supported me with this project. And also Aaron Francis from Oryx Geoscience for um, providing additional support and also providing the data. All right, thanks a lot for listening to my presentation. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Hiba. We will uh, start our discussion with Mary Jane. It's all yours. Thanks, Hiba. Great job. Um, it was such a pleasure to work with you this summer and great to see uh, the results of all, of all of the data and that work that we probably never would have seen the light uh, if it weren't for your uh, GIS skills. Um, so now that you know how the indices would predict uh, structural diversity, I was wondering how we might be able to integrate the data into our operations planning. Yeah, um, so I would definitely recommend, at least with the basal area model and also the structural diversity models, though they do predict they're not as great. 
um, with the uh, PTA data, so like PTA ground data, and trying to identify areas that are pretty overstocked and have like a relatively high basal area that could um, really benefit from some like regular shelter wood or more harvest management practices that provide more structural diversity in the data. Um, also for identifying species at risk, I know the Medway really, that's a really core part of the Medway Community Forest Co-op. And so looking at those areas that could be potential um, species at risk habitats, but are currently clear cut like areas near water bodies um, could be another way that could really benefit the forest. And just another question, uh, would you feel comfortable using the data without ground truthing? Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, definitely for the basal area model. I think since it does show a little bit more variation, um, I would personally rerun the models with the LIDAR data and include the additional ground points, because um, I think that will increase the accuracy. Great. Thanks, Eva. Hey, go ahead. Hey, uh, interesting presentation. Um, I, these, these questions, some of this may be um, stuff just that I missed because you tended to go like zoo, pretty quick through some stuff. <laughs> Tension wavered for a second, I might've missed it. Um, so you didn't tell us, is this a, so this is a multispectral scanner. Is it, is it something like, what kind of sensor is it? Um, it is a airborne la laser sensor from what I understand. So it is a laser, but um, it doesn't, I don't know quite how it works, but I know some of the limitations of it. So it doesn't hit the actual ground level. So the way that the canopy height model is made or the digital terrain models are made is by looking at like taking a 3D look at the images. So looking at like a photo here, a photo here, a photo here, and then kind of reconstructing it. Um, so I know like how it works. I don't know quite the like specifics. So it's, it is lighter or it's not lighter? It's not lighter, no, no. So lighter would be like a laser that hits it directly to the ground. Yeah, um, I know that takes lighter an is. image and then uses those images to reconstruct like a 3D. Uh, okay. I'm a bit confused. It'd be useful to have a good, better idea about what exactly how this thing is working. Yeah. Um, a second qu or related question, how much like I miss, so are these fixed area plots on the ground? Yeah, they're so they're ground they're fixed, plots. Fixed area yeah. plots, right? And how accurately are they geo-referenced? Um, I guess you could say not that <laughs> accurately. Because I mean, um, if, you're, if you're just using a handheld GPS, then you know, you're gonna be anywhere from 10 meters off, or if, you know, maybe, maybe worse. So um, I wonder how much of the slop in the R, part of the slop in the R squareds will be because of that um, inaccurate georeferencing. Um, so it might be useful, for example, to get into those, uh, if you're gonna keep using those plots, for example, Mary Jane, it'd be useful to get in there with like an XS, SX blue or some kind of more accurate GPS to get better positions. Because I don't know what the, what's the resolution of the sensor, because if you're off six or eight meters, that could introduce quite a bit of slot. So yeah, the resolution is 33 millimeters. Um, so the actual imagery is pretty, is pretty high resolution. I think also, um, I try to imagine, kind of... imagine if your ground plot is eight meters away from where the actual, you know, it actually is. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a concern with the data, of course. Um, I think maybe like, with the with doing like a stand level, um, like a stand level modeling. So like the approach that I did with the stands, maybe a, a way to kind of mitigate for that, but it's definitely gonna still be a limitation since it's not like accurate to a high degree in terms of like the ground plots. Cool. Oh, um, Mary Jane just said the GPS uses accurate to two meters. Oh, so that's not bad. Yeah, seems like a good a good clarification. Um, Sean, you have a question. Um, yeah, I, it, in terms of assessing the accuracy of 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 these things, the R squared, you know, will be uh, really greatly influenced by the range of points that you're looking at, and uh, you know, so uh, 
you're oftentimes interested in what the absolute accuracy is. And so I'd really encourage you to use a, a root mean squared error. Um, so you can, you know, make statements about this being, you know, a basal area uh, prediction within a certain range of absolute basal area. So I, I so I guess the question, if, if you've done those kind of additional uh, error analyses in addition, in addition to just looking at the R squared? Yeah, so I did calculate root mean squared error. I didn't include it in the presentation. Yeah. Okay, thought, that's yeah. good. That's good. And the other, uh, you know, kind of, uh, quantification I issue, I, uh, the Gini coefficient and the, the Macintosh are uh, kind of a bo both obscure for this purpose, right? So there's been a lot more use of diversity indices like a, a Shannon index with, with you know, kind of uh, uh, yeah, uh, putting things into categories uh, or just a coefficient of variation or so forth. So I, I, I guess putting that as a question, have you looked at some other uh, kinds of structural diversity indices? Yeah, so I actually um, kind of anticipated this question. Um, I first started by looking at the Gini coefficient due to a previous study that similar to the one I did that used the Gini coefficient. Um, so I kind of started with that. And then actually, um, John encouraged me to look at more structural indices. Mm -hmm. So I ended up finding a paper that compared structural indices, so structural diversity indices, and Shannon, um, the Shannon index, or even this index, um, was one of them. But the study actually looked at different influences. So like, for example, the Gini coefficient is influenced by the range of the data. Um, the Macintosh looks at evenness, and then um, the uh, BP index looks at the dominant like size class in comparison to the total basal area. So I kind of decided to pick one from each category, but I I could definitely incorporate like the Shannon index as well. Okay, great, good answer. I have a question, Hila. Yep. Um, so looking at your graphs and the and the, uh, the with the bias over predicting at the low end, um, I was just wondering did did you do any kind of um, assessment of heteroscedasticity, uh, for example, um, or more generally, um, what when you looked at the you know your assumptions about how the data are distributed, um, what did you do? Just because that could alleviate some of that bias if you say, for example, allowed for heteroscedasticity, meaning more variance at the low end, consistent with that graph you showed of a partial harvest with the white pine, um, maybe that would reduce some of the bias in your predictions. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm not quite familiar with that, um, but I think looking at the ground plot data from the beginning would be um, a good way. I don't know. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. But you can explain it to me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing because Jay's commenting about my sketchy background here. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely. I think it, there was definitely a bias within the data um, with the lack of clear cut points or like lack of young stands. Um, and that could be incorporated. OK. That's great. Time for one last quick question, if one's out there. I have a quick question for Kiba. Sorry. Um, so you mainly focused on the BA and the DBH in your structural um, focus there, but would you be able to identify tree species with the data and how might that impact the management plan you would recommend? Um, it it would be difficult. It would be a little more difficult to do that. Um, it's an interesting concept for sure, but I think uh, you would need to do individual tree classification. So it would definitely take a lot more ground data. You'd have to like actually have more accurate um, points. Like you would have to go and like GPS, like an actual tree and look at the metrics to kind of be able to then train um, your model to be able to pick up on species. Um, but it is possible, like given the data, like given like the um, 
the multispectral imagery, it, it's at a pretty high resolution. And there's the LIDAR data too. So it's possible as a future study for sure. That's great. Thanks very much, Eva. Future work is needed. <laughs>